peace of the Lord be with you. It's a wonderful, wonderful world. It is a world charged with the grandeur of God. It is the theater of the Creator's glory. Ours is a world from the deepest ocean depths to the highest peak of the Himalaya, a world that evokes a sense of awe and mystery. Louis Armstrong had it correct. It is a world that is wonder-filled, which is why I love to watch planet Earth, to watch all of that amazing footage, rarely captured by any human being, to see the wonders of the whales and the mountains and the deep down forests and all the creatures that dwell there. When I watch planet Earth, I can't help but think of Psalm 8. Tonight, my friends, as we open up the prayer book of the Bible, I want to invite us to pray together Psalm 8. My hope and my aim is that as we pray Psalm 8 together, it might nourish us for a life of wonder a life where we step outside of our narrow little world and we are expanded by all of the wonder, all of the radical amazement, all of the things that we can know and study. So let's read Psalm 8 together, shall we? Psalm 8. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Psalm 8, this hymn of creation, evokes a sense of wonder. And I believe that it is one of the most important psalms that we can pray to regain what we need most in life. I believe that one of the biggest crises is we face right now is not economic, it's not social, it's not sexual, but it is our lack of fundamental wonder about all that God has made and redeemed. For wonder is the prelude to our worship, and if we don't have wonder, we can't have faith. As we grow older, and as our culture advances, our sense of wonder declines. This decline is alarming for the state of our souls and is in want of a cure. For we will not perish for want of information, but only for want of wonder. Failure to wonder is the mark and tragedy of our age. This is the diagnosis of Charles Taylor, who in his book, The Secular Age, has described our cultural moment as the epoch of disenchantment. Taylor observes that we once inhabited a world in which it was largely impossible not to believe in God, but now we find ourselves inhabiting a disenchanted world where walking away from faith in God is for many a live and living option. But Taylor observes that without a sense of God, we have no sense of who we are. And if we have no sense of who we are, we have no sense of why we are here. 
we lack a vision for our life. And this lack of vision inflicts at the lowest and highest levels all of our cultural institutions, whether economic or political, whether they're in healthcare or in the legal arena, and even and especially in higher education. Our problem is that we, when we lose a sense of wonder, we often absorb the cultural attitude that is infected with a casual, too cool to care, or a Seinfeld sense of ironic indifference. Rather than giving ourselves permission, to live into the epic adventure of Jesus Christ's mission of reconciliation of all things, where the Holy Spirit animates us to pursue a life that embodies the mission of the saints of God here on earth right now. I see it even here sometimes at hope. A lack of wonder. We walk around in the cold, depressed, downcast, with long in the mouth, instead of approaching the day in a purposeful joy. It plagues us at Phelps, where the lack of wonder impacts even our eating. We shovel food into our mouths without savoring, without taking time to appreciate how the flavor of that burrito explodes into our mouth with delight. Yes, if we have wonder, it can fill us with delight even at Phelps. It happens when we go to class in Lubbers Hall, when we arrive barely on time, slouched over with a sense of bored indifference in the back row, expecting nothing from a lecture, and therefore usually getting nothing, rather than showing up early and sitting up straight with a red-hot passion that is determined to discover something new about this world God made and redeemed. It happens when we sit next to someone in chapel and we don't recognize, we don't see that this person right next to you is someone crowned with glory and honor. It happens to us sometimes when we walk outside of our cottages under the canopy of the dark sky, not even looking up and marveling at the moon and the stars because our eyes are too focused on our feet. We lose our wonder at our own peril. And I wonder and I ask you tonight, does this describe you? Do you live with a daily sense of wonder? If this does describe you, I want to invite you to do something. I want to invite you to do what Abraham Heschel, the Jewish rabbi and mystic, and one of the 20th century's most perceptive spiritual visionaries, what he did when he sensed that the world was limiting his connection with God, that this modern world had a sense of reducing the mysteries down to a mathematical formula, what he did was pray. And he prayed this. He prayed, I didn't... I did not, I asked God for something, but I did not pray or ask God for success in this life. I prayed for wonder, and God gave it to me. That's what I want to invite us to do, is pray for wonder, that it might mark our life in our going out and our coming in. If you are sensing a lack of wonder creeping into your life, Just like Abraham Heschel, we need to pray and ask God for wonder. For if we ask, we shall receive. And one of our best prayers we have to pray to guide us back into the sacred world of God's ongoing care is Psalm 8. Psalm 8 is a prayer that is a re-entry into the reality of a good creation that evokes a profound sense of awe and radical amazement. It gives us a frame or a telescope into reality. It whispers our true identity, reminding us of who and whose we are. And it is a prayer that offers us an invitation to answer the question, why are we here? It is a psalm that reminds us that we have a purpose, a charge of our life that exposes a meaning with a deep down joy. Now, we don't know exactly when Psalm 8 was written, but by tradition, it is attributed to David, the warrior poet king, 
We do know that it was set to music and sung as a hymn. I imagine that the elderly David walked outside his palace in Jerusalem, remembering all those lonely nights as a boy underneath the stars. And now David is a king. But then he remembered he was just a shepherd. Now he commands an army. And then he just had a slingshot. Then he watched over his father's flock, and now he watches over God's people as a beloved kingdom. All things had been placed under David's feet, and yet then as now David was under the same constellation of stars, then as now he was under the same canopy of God's grace. Out on his palace deck, David looking up, remembering his life, is overwhelmed with awe that this God who creates and sustains all things, the God who with a word creates the immensities of the galaxies, could care for him, could care for Israel, God's covenant people. He looks up with wonder, and he begins to sing, O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than God and has crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands and have set all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also all beasts of the field, all the birds of the air and all the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Psalm 8 is a prayer that guides us into a life of wonder because its very structure of the psalm frames our life in God. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Say that with me. Just the opening line. O Lord. Okay, well, hold on. Let's get this right. All right. I'll say it. You repeat. How's that? All right. O Lord, o Lord. our sovereign, how majestic, How majestic is your name, is your name. In, all the earth. in all the earth? All together. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth? Now, when we read this psalm together, did you notice that the first verse is the same as the last verse? Do you see that the beginning of the prayer is the same as the end? I think the poet King is trying to tell us something. The psalmist is telling us that a proper perspective of reality is a life bracketed by the living God from start to finish, from the rising to the setting sun, from our rising up to our lying down, and all the moments in between. Our life is not our own, but takes place within the context of God's gracious and sovereign reign. All that is, is because God is. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth is the beginning of Psalm 8 and the end of Psalm 8. This reframe reminds us that, the, the, that this world is a creation that belongs to a creator and that all that is in it has its correspondence to his care. David prays. And begins and ends his psalm, acknowledging who God is. O oh Lord, our sovereign. Sovereignty is one of those attributes we attribute to the eternal God. Sovereignty suggests a God of ultimate power of creation. Only a sovereign God has the transcendent power to put the stars into the dome of the sky and who also has the tenderness to breathe into us the very breath of life. God cares about all things, creates all things. And I think this should encourage us to go outside and to explore. 
Go to a place where there are no lights. Look up at the stars and the moon and locate the Milky Way. If you are lucky, you might find yourself on a narrow path that will lead you deep into a forest. Follow it until you reach the foothills and then let the path take you up past the rock fields and the tree line and then climb up the craggy cliffs and journey across the snow fields until the path leads you farther up and further into the high country where the air is thin and where the word is amplified voice that echoes down the canyons of time. And if you are lucky enough to find yourself here, look up and see, for the world is dazzling in glory. Look and see the work of God's fingers. Look and see and be filled with wonder. This summer, I got an iPad. I won't lie, it's cool. <laughs> I like the apps. I didn't even know what apps were a year ago, but now they're like my favorite thing to research, <laughs> apps. And one of my favorite apps on my iPad is called Skywalker. Skywalker is um, an educational program, and you can, you can look up at any point in the sky, and it shows you the constellation that you're looking at. So that uh, if I'm looking south, I look up, I know exactly where all the stars are. I, I kind of like astronomy. I just think looking up and in, out into the outer space is one of the most mind-bending, explo exploding things you can kind of do. And one of my favorite features on this app is daily photos I get from the Hubble telescope. These are some of the, these are some of the rarest um, and newest pictures that we have that go hundreds and millions of miles away. As we eat and drink and go about our daily life, there are all these worlds out there going on, and I get to watch it on my, on my app. It's pretty cool. These, these stars, I just think that's all going on right now. And we see it through this little telescope, well, this big telescope. These planets, all that energy, stardust. It's beautiful. And it goes on whether we look at it or not. It's just there. All for the glory of God. It's beautiful. I think it's beautiful. Prayer, Psalm 8, I think is a prayer a lot like the Hubble telescope. It helps us look farther up and further into the deep mystery of reality. Psalm 8 is a telescope that keeps our life in a tight frame within God's sovereign care. And you see, that is the wonder. The same God who has the power to create all of that out in the universe, the moon and the stars of the sky, is the same God that is mindful of you. The same God who cares for you for your life, for your concerns, whatever they are. The same God that has the power to, with a word, make the suns and the moon and the constellations and the Milky Way is the same God who cares as intensely for what is going on in your life. And that fills us with a sense of wonder that God cares for us. When I look at your hands, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of us, mortals that you care for us? What should fill us with wonder when we pray Psalm 8 is that God cares for us. For you, Lori, and for you, Brooke, and for you, Jennifer, and David, and Alan. For you, Dr. Bullman. For you, Jesse. For you up in the balcony, God cares for each one of you. Each one. And God cares for me. God set the sun and the moon and the stars and the dome of the sky, yet God is mindful of us. That is what fills me with wonder when I enter into Psalm 8. 
when I enter into Psalm 8, I have this overwhelming sense that I belong to a God and been located in a place that God cares about. I'm reminded of a God who loves me. And above all, when I pray Psalm 8, I'm reminded that I have a profound and important identity. David's prayer goes on, echoing Genesis 1. You have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. Who are we? We are people made by God and crowned with glory and honor. We have the very stamp of the divine in us. We have the gifts of reason and imagination. We have memory and a conscience. We have the capacity to make life. We can learn. We have opposable thumbs. Each of you here tonight, though fallen, each of us, even though we are sick with sin, each of us is crowned with glory and honor. Remember that the next time you look in the mirror. And remember that each time you encounter another person. It is this truth that allows us to embrace the other with equal wonder. I like how C.S. Lewis describes this truth in his famous sermon, The Weight of Glory. Lewis writes, It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption, such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, art, civilizations, these are mortal, and their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendor. There are no ordinary people, yourself included. And I think that is what Psalm 8 is helping me to pray into. The question is, what is all this glory and honor for? Why are we here? To borrow from Heschel again, it is not enough for me to be able to say I am. I want to know who I am and in relation to whom I live. It is not enough for me to ask questions. I want to know how to answer the one question that seems to encompass everything I face. What am I here for? What am I here for? What are you here for? Psalm 8 helps us to answer that question. It gives our life a purpose. David prays in verse 6, You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have set all things under their feet. All sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, all the birds of the air, all the fish of the sea, everything that passes through the paths of the seas. Why are we here? We are here because God has crowned us with glory and honor. We are here as those endowed with God's own image to practice dominion in this creation, to care for all that God has created and redeemed in Christ. Psalm 8 charges our life with meaning because it reminds us that the earth belongs to God, not to us. But even so, God has given us dominion over everything he has created. And this is what people are for. Now, dominion is not the same thing as domination. To be given dominion is to be given a responsibility and trust. It is to serve and protect. We have been put here on earth by God to care for and to love all that God has made. And what this means is that God has a job for you to do. It means that your life has a purpose. And your purpose is to have a vision for more than just getting a job in order to have enough money to buy a house and go shopping whenever you want. As people crowned with glory and honor, people for whom God has put all things under our feet, we are charged with an epic responsibility. And that is why you are here getting an education at Hope College. The question is how? 
You are going to use your skills, how you will use your endowed glory and honor to serve your creator. How will you use your gifts as one a little lower than God to practice dominion? How will you practice dominion in law and in medicine and in education and in economics and in politics? You are not here for yourself. This is not a playground in order just to have a good time. You are here to endow your mind, all of the resources of your being so that you can go out and have welfare of the city. You are there to go out and to care for all that God has made. Your life is charged with a purpose because God has made you a little lower than God, crowned you with glory and honor, and set all things under your feet. And this should inspire us with a deep down passion every single day to study, to reflect, to think, to love, and to be loved. We are charged with a purpose larger than our imagination. And if we can enter into that purpose, every single moment of our life is filled with wonder. I believe that if we are rooted in the historic Christian faith and we are not here merely to pursue another rung on the ladder of the American dream, but to use all our life, our breath, to pursue the dream of God, to embody the gospel for the world, to embody the mission where all things at all times and in all places are reconciled and unified in Christ that is made possible through the blood of the cross. That is what should charge our life with wonder and give our days a steady purpose. And that is why we pray day and night from the beginning and to the end. O Lord, our Sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And the good news to us is that this majestic name has been revealed to the world. It is the name of Jesus. And if you don't know, this Jesus is also the same creator celebrated in Psalm 8. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing has come into being. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. We are not our own, but belong body and soul to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is our sovereign, and his majesty is the cross, where we see that he had the power to embrace weakness, the pride to be humble, the vision to help all the blind to see. He is the light that overcomes the darkness. And the good news is that he still does. For death could not contain him. And right now he is alive at the right hand of the Father. And all the saints are gathered around his throne, the living and the dead. Jesus is still the one who can speak a word and create something new in our life and in your life and to cast the darkness out. Jesus is the sovereign whose name is majestic in all the earth, and he is the source that fills our life with wonder. And so, my friends, as you go into this week, as we travel through January and February, as we get over colds that make our throats deep, may you pray with the overwhelming sense that this Jesus who was and who is still is for us, a God who creates something new and gives your life a steady purpose and direction. And may it fill you with wonder. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, everyone said, amen.